Thank you. Um, okay, first of all, I'm Wayne Sokola. Um, I'm not a resident of Bel Air. Um, actually, I grew up in Washington, PA, and went to high school in Claysville, PA at McGuffey High School. It's not too that far from here. Um, but thank you for uh, inviting me to the lecture series. I appreciate it. I'll put these on so I can actually see. <laughs> um, okay, first and foremost, I want to take you all the ways back to 1939. Okay, you, you may ask, why 1939? Well, it was uh, after World War I, and the United States, uh, most of the citizens of the United States, they were isolationists. They didn't want to go be involved in that war over in Europe. That, that war over there was for them, and we, we weren't going to get involved with it. Well, with the asking of um, the Brits, uh, we got into a program uh, right around uh, 1939, and that's when the war really started for World War II. Not for us, because we weren't directly involved, okay? But what we did was we got into the thing, it was called Lend-Lease Program. Okay, that's where we took and set up all of our factories, and we started producing tanks and airplanes and such to help support the war effort, although we weren't directly providing soldiers but we were providing equipment and shipping that overseas. Now, this is all under FDR, okay, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. He was our president from 1933 all the way until 1945. He actually died in office just a few months before the war was actually, World War II was actually over with. Um, but uh, as part of the Lend-Lease program, uh, we, got, we sent all that equipment overseas, and it helped build up all of our factories. Okay, so FDR actually knew that sometime we were probably going to get involved with World War II. And when something happened, um, all of our factories would be set up and equipped to keep on producing all this war equipment. And so what happened was, um, double check, make sure I'm correct here. Um, Okay, December 7th, 1941. And people know that day, it's a day to live in infamy. Okay, that's Pearl Harbor. That's when the United States entered the war. Okay, at this point in time, it really took us by surprise. We didn't expect this, we would be getting involved with the war, but boom, it hit us, okay? And it hit us hard. Um, at the time, we had the draft, but actually, you would be surprised. There were more volunteers coming from little towns, little steel mill towns and such, all throughout the United States, and people were volunteering. They were getting, grabbing all their buddies. They were getting in line. They were going down there, and they were volunteering for the war. Well, what ended up happening is all the men were going overseas, and that left a lot of the women back here in the States with all the children. Okay, well, all these uh, factories that were running, all, all of the ma manufacture of arms and weapons and such, well, they needed to hire people to, to backfill and keep on producing it. And yes, there were, the men were still working there, but this is the first integration of women in the workplace, and that really took... Uh, a different effect in the United States. And everybody's heard of Rosie the Riveter. Well, I have met and talked with many of Rosie the Riveters, okay? Um, there was a lady that uh, was a buddy of my uh, grandmother of one of my uh, friends. Well, she actually passed away about a month ago, but uh, she was building the detonators for the bombs that they were using to drop overseas, okay? And then there is a little story in my little book there. It's uh, Button Button, who, or it's actually, it's taken from the quote, the name of the thing is Token Token, Where's My Token? It's taken from a little rhyme, it's Button Button, Where's My Button, okay? And she put a nice little story in there, and I talked to her daughter, and uh, daughter lives out in Washington, D.C., and she was totally elated that I was go willing to put her uh, mother's story in here to pass along to everybody. And it, it's first-hand accounts of everything that she remembers about rationing through the whole entire time of World War II. And there's a couple other nice little stories in there. Um, 
Let me see here. Okay. Um, in the United States at this time, um, there were, it was encouraged uh, for families to take and start doing raising your own crops, your own animals. Even if you lived in the city, they were taking unused uh, uh, pla places and uh, lots in the city and they were turning them into victory gardens and such. Well, victory gardens were sometimes individuals. They were community efforts. You would raise tomatoes, potatoes, whatever, and that would be shared throughout everybody that helped with that effort to uh, keep the uh, garden going, okay? And sometimes, what would people would do is, and we'll get into this with the, uh, the ration uh, booklets here. They're full of little stamps. Well, sometimes you would get each family, depending upon the number of people they had in their family the, and the ages, they would get different amounts of stamps. And they would pull these and you would take and maybe you would get a portion of meat. Well, and different things like vegetables. Well, if you were already supplementing your uh, diet with your own garden, they would take and they would pull several families together and they would make lots of soup, okay? And that's one of the things that they did. And you stretch, you stretch your supplies as far as you possibly could, okay? And let me double check my facts here. Okay, um, these little books with the little stamps in them, the very first book, these were issued in May of 1942. Well, the, the OPA, Office of Price Administration, had only started on, uh, about six months earlier, and that was under a law from the federal government that the, this be put in place so that they could ration certain items, okay? Now, the very first book that came out, it was titled Book One, okay? It, the very first thing that they really rationed was sugar, okay? And sugar rationing actually lasted clear past world, the end of the war. The war ended in 1945. They actually rationed clear until 1947 for sugar, okay? And you go, sugar? Well, yeah, sugar, it, it had to be shipped into the United States and such, and it was actually hard to come by. And um, people that were doing their own canning, like of fruits and stuff, they would want the sugar for that, okay? so. It was actually something hard to get. The second thing that was uh, rationed with the ration book one was coffee. Okay, well, nobody can work without coffee, and they you barely got enough coffee rations to squeak by, so what you were doing was borrowing stamps from neighbors that wouldn't drink coffee and such. And they did a little bit of trading here and there. You weren't allowed, but you know how it is. Okay. Um, Every time it was time for you to take and get a ration book, they had a form, and I got a sample form up here, a blank one. You had to go into your house and you had to inventory every can good that was in your house. It didn't matter if it was a meat product, a vegetable, they wanted to count, okay? And then you're like, hmm, well, what about all that bottles of stuff that I was doing all that canning with? Those count against your, uh, your total. So if you had, 30 jars of canned goods and two canned goods there, that went against you. And when you went to get your issued your uh, stamps, they were pulling some out of your book and you weren't, you didn't get that many more stamps. So you'll see, and old timers will tell you, um, they would take and they would can products, they would hide them in their garage and the rafters. There were people that were canning them and burying them and they were breaking them out. And Sometimes they, if, if a person, maybe they had a peach tree in their yard, they would do the canning and they would be passing out uh, canned goods to all their neighbors so on the back end. Hopefully they would be sharing something back with them. Okay, so it really brought a lot of the communities together. And one of the things that, uh, the reasons that they did the rationing, there was, it was twofold. Okay, so one was so that they had enough, uh, food items to send overseas to the soldiers. But the second reason was that they wanted to, the federal government wanted to get everybody in the United States involved with the war in one way or another, okay? Whether it be collecting aluminum, or at the time, tin cans, 
or any kind of metals. Um, going to 1943, there was such a shortage of copper, they didn't even have enough copper to make the pennies in the United States. They made them out of steel coated with zinc for that year, okay? And why copper? Well, copper is one of the items that they use to make brass, and those are used for bullets. And they were producing that and sending it overseas to the soldiers. Okay, also uh, book one, the other item that was uh, being rationed was shoes, okay? And um, at the time, you would, that's when a lot of hand-me-downs started. If, you, if your kids were growing, outgrowing their shoes, you found out who was in line to get the next uh, size shoe up from your neighbors so, that you, so your kids had something to wear. Okay. Um, book, Ration Book 2 came out about six months later in January of 43. Okay. This is the first time that uh, rationing really took place for um, specific items of food, okay? Now, in the books, they, they now had different colored stamps. Some of the stamps were blue, and some of the stamps were red, and there were various different colors, okay? The, for us, I'm going to talk about the red and the blue right now. Um, the red items, okay, the red stamps, they were used for things like butter, margarine, cheese. They, they said fats, okay? Well, if anybody knows what fats are, it's lard, okay? Grandma cooked with lard all the time. It was real bad for you, but hey, she did. Um, canned meats, canned, canned fish, that was all the red stamps. There were also the blue stamps in there, okay? These were for canned items of canned vegetables or fruits, okay? So if it was canned peas, there you go. That's a, that's a blue stamp, okay? And in, on the stamps, they were numbered at the top A to Z, okay? That was a time period. And then each stamp had a, a, a little numeric fig number on there from one to like eight. And what you should have done is when you go grocery shopping, you would have to present your pull out certain stamps and they all the items on the shelf would have two prices it will say 25 cents for a can of peas and two blue stamps okay so what you did was you tried to figure out walk around the aisles and try to maximize what you could buy at what time because you needed to have enough of these stamps for that period to be able to buy or make whatever you needed to. And if you didn't have uh, enough stamps for that given period, well, it's time to rewrite what you're going to have for the, on the menu for that week. Okay. Um, okay. Book number three came out in October of 1943. Okay, uh, book three, it w was a little bit more unique. Um, it was very patriotic. There were things like airplanes on there, aircraft carriers, tanks, field artillery pieces, and they all were designated. They were still color-coded, so you knew what they were for, but it got the... Uh, they, are, they were like a little collector's item in themselves at the time, and everybody was looking through them, and they were like, yeah, hey, I'm getting involved, with, I'm supporting the war effort, okay? Um, book number four, that was released right, right at the uh, end of December of 43, okay? And basically, that book was good up until the end of uh, the war in 45, Okay, so if they if you needed to be issued additional book fours, it was all, per family, and uh, the OPA boards would deal with that. And the, um, the one change that really happened uh, for book four is where my collection comes into play. Okay, it's these little red and blue tokens. Okay, well these little red and blue tokens correspond with the red and blue stamps inside of book four, okay? And these were uh, given as change. So if you 
were a grocer, you would take and you would sign for so many boxes or a case of these tokens. So you had the red ones and the blue ones and they were given this change. Now, what was nice is these little tokens never expired, whereas the stamps in there did. If, you, if it was an A and a four, well, that was only good for week A, okay? And so what you did was you would go to the grocery store and if it was getting close to the end of the week, you made sure that you used all your stamps and got as many of these little red and blue tokens because those could be used out throughout the rest of the year. So if you had a, a stamp for an eight, you would go into the store, like it's like buying a pack of gum nowadays, if you want to break a dollar, okay? Well, same thing, you take and pay with an eight and buy something that has a st uh, stamp uh, on there for one, so that you get seven of these little tokens back. That way you build a little reservoir of uh, tokens that you can use throughout the year. Okay, on the tokens themselves, um, and I wrote about this in my book, uh, and I put a checklist at the back of the book. For the red tokens, neck, if you look real close at the little token, beside the one that's on there, there's two little number or letters stamped in, like M, M, Y, C, M, V. Um, these are part of the production line. There was, uh, for the red one, there were 30 different color combina or code combinations. And for the blue ones, there were 24 different code combinations, okay? And what these were is they actually, the, they knew for where the dyes were producing this specific uh, token at. And that way, if, if something would come up missing or a, a die would come up missing or whatever, they, they could tra trace it back to where it, where it was actually being produced, what production line, whatever. And another neat little thing about these little tokens is they were actually supposed to be bigger. They were supposed to be about the size of a nickel. Well, what they did was at the end, they decided to go with something a little bit smaller. They, didn't, they wanted something that wouldn't jam up the pay phones at the time, okay? And these little tokens right here would slide right through. And there were different, uh, what they did was, there was a little competition put out there among manufacturers at the time. And they wanted something, okay, because they didn't want them uh, to use any resources that would cut into anything being used by the military, like copper and such like that, but they wanted something durable, so it couldn't be like cardboard or paper, and they wanted something that uh, would hold up. Well, there were two contenders for two different companies at the end, and one was a lead alchemy uh, coin, and one was this fiber coin, okay? And the reason they didn't go with the lead uh, alchemy one was because women at the time, when they'd go out, they would wear white gloves and the, the lead would rub off on them. So this guy won out. And all it is, it's fiber, it's like a fiber board, and it's vulcanized. And vulcan, vulcanization is what they actually do to like make tires and retreads and such. It's a rubber coating that's vulcanized, which means it's heat and, heated and applied onto there. And what they did was, if you look at it real carefully, it says OPA, it's got the one stamped in the middle, it means it's worth one point, it's got your two little letters, but uh, they, real closely, if you look at the one, the one is a hollow letter. They did that to be, make it look like it was three-dimensional so that people could see it easier. Okay.